we sometimes tend to focus so much on the trees that we don't see the forest. Let me summarize, I think, the situation in, with three words. Massive, systematic, and dangerous. Massive, systematic, and dangerous. With these three words, Fernande Verain started his United Nations Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues. This is the fourth time USCIRF recommends India as a country of particular concern for religious freedom. Now, what does CPC mean? Country of particular concern is a designation by the United States Secretary of State of a country responsible for particularly severe violations of religious freedom under the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998. USCIRF Commissioner Nadine Manza provided an overview of religious freedom conditions in India in 2020 itself, stating USCIRF has been recommending India as country of particular concern. You know, India has a beautiful history of pluralism that has been thriving for thousands of years. It has a constitution that established the nation as being secular, with Article 25 granting all individuals freedom of conscience, including the right to practice, profess, and propagate religion. But with the BJP leading the government since 2014, we've seen it erode the secular principles by aggressively advocating for a pure Hindu state, causing religious freedom conditions to worsen. During this past year, the government continued to promote and enforce Hindu nationalist policies impacting Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, Dalits, Adivasis, and others resulting in systematic, ongoing, and egregious violations of religious freedom. USERF has once again recommended India be designated as, as a State Department by the State Department for a country of particular concern or a CPC. So we continue to see mob act, mobs acting with impunity, targeting minorities, national governments and individual state governments passing discriminatory laws and policies that limit the lawful activities of religious minorities and a violent crackdown on civil society and dissent. The combination is creating a dangerous environment for religious communities. In 2020, passing the Citizenship Amendment Act or the CAA was a major moment for the government of India, according to a recent report issued by the University of California, Berkeley. The CAA gave precedent to religion as a criteria for citizenship in India for the first time. Muslims were the only religious group excluded from equal treatment under the CAA. So the CAA provides fast track for Indian citizenship for non-Muslims from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and Pakistan who live in India. This has empowered mobs sympathetic to Hindu nationalism to operate with impunity against Muslims, mosques, Muslim majority neighborhoods. And the CAA in conjunction with the proposed National Register of Citizens or the NRC would require all residents to provide documentation of citizenship could lead to statelessness, deportation, or long detention. The implementation of this in Assam gave us a chilling example. So in 2019, Assam implemented the NRC. It ended up excluding 1.9 million residents, leaving 700,000 Muslims at significant risk of being stripped of their identity. Authorities surveilled, harassed, detained, and prosecuted a number of journalists, lawyers, rights activists, and religious minorities advocating for religious freedom. Let's listen in to the complete reportage from the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedoms hearing on advancing religious freedom within the U.S. Distinguished Commissioners, good morning, bonjour. We sometimes tend to focus so much on the trees that we don't see the forest. Let me summarize, I think, the situation in, with three words. Massive, systematic, and dangerous. Along with a number of UN Special Rapporteurs, I have recently expressed grave and growing concerns regarding the deteriorating situation of religious freedom and human rights in India. We have in the last decade, for example, issued numerous communications and press releases, uh, communications being allegations of human rights violations that are raised through diplomatic channels to the concerned governments. They show, well, they show a steady and alarming erosion of fundamental rights, particularly for religious and other minorities, when we reviewed communications from about 2011 to today. By last year, 2022, almost all of them involved grave allegations of denial of fundamental rights, particularly targeting religious minorities. And for example, from the 12th of May 2020 to just a few months ago, May 2023, we had about 46 communications and an estimated 20 press releases involving India, and most of these involving minorities, the vast majority of these. The most recent example, the most recent communication that we issued is perhaps symptomatic. 
on the 4th of September, myself and 18 other uh, colleagues express our alarm about reports of serious human rights violations in Manipur, including alleged acts of sexual violence, extrajudicial killings, forced displacement, and other ill treatment, uh, where the victims were from the predominantly Christian Kuki or Kukai minority last May. Now, there are dry statistics. I could say there were 160 persons reportedly killed uh, by mid-August. Thousands of homes and hundreds of churches have been burnt down, and some will you, of you will have heard of a video which circulated on social media on, of two women from the Christian Kuki uh, community being paraded naked, beaten, then brought to a field and allegedly gang raped. Let's go to the field. Let's go on the ground and perhaps describe more ac accurately what happened. There was inaction from authorities until this video caught the international attention. I saw that video, and what it showed was hatred, hatred directed against women because they were considered a threat, unworthy, less human, because they belonged to a despised religious and ethnic minority. That's why they were raped. That's why they were beaten. It was only after the shock and outcry and pressure from the outside that men from the Hindu majority were finally arrested and charged. By the way, these individuals for months circulated freely and behaved without, with complete impunity for months, despite the highly visible public and horrific nature of what occurred. And this, unfortunately, is not an isolated incident. We receive multitudes of reports of attacks, rapes, lynchings of members of religious minorities. We also have reports of national, state, and local religiously discriminatory policies and legislation targeting, well, amongst others, and you've mentioned some of these, um, the Chair, uh, religious conversion, interfaith re relationships, the killing of cows, the wearing of hijabs, and other practices that restrict and prohibit religious beliefs or practices of minorities mainly. And all of these make a mockery of freedom of religion and non-discrimination guarantees for these religious and other minorities. Human rights defenders, lawyers, and journalists face harassment, uh, surveillance, detention, and worse sometimes under the, as mentioned previously, the Un Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. You also know that non-governmental uh, governmental organizations have also been targeted and in some cases closed under the Foreign Contributions Regulation Act and also other legislation. Now let me repeat. India risks becoming, in my opinion, based on the information I've received and the allegations we've received, it risks becoming one of the world's main generators of instability, atrocities, and violence because of the massive scale and gravity of the violations and abuses targeting, not exclusively, but mainly religious and other minorities, such as Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, and others. It's not just individual or local. It is systematic and a reflection of, well, I guess the best description is religious nationalism. There, are there is a discriminatory citizenship determination process in Assam, which many of you will know about in, in detail, but potentially also other regions of the world. Assam is a model being looked at very closely in other parts of India, and this we should be very concerned with. But this process could lead to millions being denied citizenship, and mainly, not exclusively again, but mainly from the Muslim minority community. And this process has to be seen also in the light of the 1999 Citizenship Amendment Act, which provides a fast track to citizenship for individuals unless you're a Muslim. Now, there's a religious test here, which does not sit well with democratic values and fundamental international human rights. Now, there are fears uh, expressed by many that this may be part of an effort to create a religious and discriminatory test for citizenship. The disenfranchisement of millions also, again, mainly Muslims because of their religion, has occurred through the revocation 
uh, in 2019 of the special status of autonomy of Jammu and Kashmir. Now under the direct control of the central Indian government, this really means that the, uh, local uh, elected bodies have been discarded and the right of political participation and representation of once again, mainly Muslim and other minorities in Jammu and Kashmir has effectively been stripped away. And they've lost many of their previous political rights. A study uh, noted uh, recently that there has been a staggering increase, a 786% increase in hate crimes against minorities between 2014 and 2018. It is also widely acknowledged that hate speech and content inciting violence against religious minorities in social media is widespread, increasing, vitriolic, and involving incitement to violence and even calls to genocide. And not always, but we could say generally, these are largely left unchallenged by state authorities. Official silence is too often occurring over violent attacks and rhetoric. And this is encouraging majority nationalist groups to even more brazen violence with the religious tint. We must never forget that. The violence in Manipur is also a warning of the dangers of inaction. The danger is, is that left alone, many more Manipurs may erupt. India ranks as eighth country with the highest risk of mass killings. This is extremely dangerous, as I noted earlier. And this is mainly because of the targeting of religious and other minorities and is system, symptomat symptomatic of large-scale scapegoating and dehumanizing and instrumentalization of Muslims and other religious others that could lead to a slide towards horrific atrocities. Unless we forget, there cannot be peace and stability without justice, and that is the fundamental principle on which the Universal Declaration of Human Rights rests. There is, of course, much more that uh, could be said, time permitting, but I have a written summary, if you will, of the uh, uh, information that I've mentioned, which I can share with the commissioners if this would be of any assistance. Thank you very much again for the honor and the privilege of being before this distinguished commission. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Special Rapporteur, uh, Dr. Uh, De Varnes. Uh, as chair, I, I have the uh, privilege of asking the first question, and um, since I'm a rabbi, usually means there are two parts to it, so please excuse me. First one is sort of more of an overview, if you will, if you can briefly uh, give us some perspective on um, how much of these 786 percent, a staggering figure, can be traced back to ethnicity, and how much trace back to religion? Uh, for us, it's not just an intellectual exercise. Our mandate is religious freedom, human rights seen through the lens of religious freedom. And uh, you mentioned it briefly. If you have, again, some more perspective for us, uh, because social media continues to play an increasingly dominant role in everyone's lives virtually around the world, you mentioned that vigilante violence is often stoked by disinformation and social media. What is the role of the government, if at all, in combating this type of disinformation and holding perpetrators accountable? What methods or policies do you think could be effective in combating this type of disinformation? Thank you very much, Chair Cooper. Um, I do not have a, a, a clear breakdown, for example, of the, um, in the case of hate crimes involving the rise of hate crimes, the high level hate crimes uh, involving minorities. I don't have a, the statistics, statistic concerning a breakdown between ethnic and versus religion. Quite often, um, that would be a very difficult breakdown to provide. Uh, when we t talk about the cookie, a minority, for example, they are at the same time an ethnic and uh, religious, and even we could say linguistic minority. 
Uh, so I think it is uh, an exercise would be, which would be very difficult because you have a mesh of these characteristics that describe the identity of a particular community. And quite often I think it, is, it may not be possible or very useful to do so. In any event, I think what is significant in this case and perhaps should retain our attention is that in many cases, even though individuals can be distinguished on the basis of their ethnicity, the form of nationalism uh, that is often expressed and the intolerance and prejudice that you can see in social media, media it often has a religious flavor to it, even though there may be, in addition, ethnic components, for example. If we think of the, in the case of Assam, many of the uh, uh, hatred, hate speech that is uh, pr uh, circulates in social media is actually t mainly targeted towards the Bengali Muslim minority ethnic and religious at the same time, and you cannot, and you should not, in my opinion, dissociate one or, and the other. However, to go back to what is central to your question, I think, is that the form of um, prejudice that is, and hatred that tends to circulate a great deal in social media from other studies, which I can provide information about, um, almost always has a religious dimension. Not always, but I would say the vast majority of these of this uh, these do. Therefore, this is perhaps the best information I can provide. But I do have other surveys that emphasize um, that try to break down to provide a breakdown of the kind of hate speech, in particular, that you have in, so, in Indian social media currently. In terms of the role of government to combat hate speech in social media. Uh, there is an, up, there's an, an, there's an obligation, responsibility on the part of our, our government, but also a danger which we should be aware of. The danger is that, unfortunately, there are reports of government using current legislation to actually uh, repress, if you will, human rights defenders, of actually targeting the victims and those who are trying to protect the human rights of religious and other minorities. So it is a kind of dis dangerous distortion of existing legislation that sometimes occur. To answer your question more directly, what should we expect from human, uh, governments currently in relation to fighting hate crime and especially hate speech and incitement to violence and discrimination in social media? implement legislation, ensure that the legislation they have in place conforms with international human rights obligations in relation to the balance between freedom of expression and combating incitement to violence and discrimination. This is not occurring in India. There is a unbalance or legislation that actually almost completely ignores the obligations of the Indian government under existing international treaties and that, to me, is the main guidance, a guiding post that needs to emphasize and which does not exist currently. Thank you. And uh, we would love to see some additional material to be sent uh, to the commission. Uh, Vice Chair, maybe if you have a question, please. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, you mentioned that in your testimony that the National Register of Citizens in Assam has been used as a model in other parts of India. Um, would you please, uh, if you could, speak a little more about how this uh, has been implemented and about the status of those who've been excluded uh, from the National Register? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair. The pandemic has actually had a good effect in that it seems to have delayed the process in Assam, the National Registry of Citizens and the potential um, loss of citizenship or non-recognition of citizenship of millions, I think about two million individuals in Assam. Um, there has been also the process that went in place to appeal, if you will, the, um, the, the absence from the Registry of Citizens has been delayed and apparently is kind of in a semi, uh, a very slow uh, situation. In other words, things have not been proceeding in terms of the process to deny or not recognize citizenship and the process also that would allow individuals to be recognized, to be added to the citizenship registry. Apparently right now, however, there is fear that the, this, um, this situation of uncertainty is actually still very difficult or even dangerous for 
uh, uh, almost one million, or more than one million, uh, almost two million individuals whose status is uncertain and they are being denied access to basic services, for example, because their status is undetermined. Uh, it is a, there is extremely burdensome bureaucracy behind all of this, and right now it, things have not been moving forward because things have not been clarified, if you will, or have not been proceeding as they should since because of the uh, pandemic. However, there, there are reports that in uh, West Bengal, another region in India, that there are, uh, there are some parties, some politicians, putting forward a possible registry of citizens also for that region. And there are hints that at the national level, there might be something like this also be considered. Thank you very much. I yield to the chair. Thank you. Commissioner Wolf. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much for your testimony. It was very, it was very, very informative. I, I was writing some notes down, and I, I have two questions, basically, based on what you said. Do you personally, and I think it's important personally, because your view, do you personally believe that Prime Minister Modi could change what is taking place in India? And part of that question, does Prime Minister Modi care about what you and others are saying about him? I wish I, I knew. <laughs> I would answer Commissioner in the following way. Um, politically, it may, if pressure can be exercised by United Nations, the United Nations, uh, independent experts, and especially national governments, on the Indian government and Prime Minister Modi, there is potential, or there's always a possibility of a change of direction of delaying certain actions that are quite clearly massive and perhaps even uh, atro atrocious, if that's a, the correct word. Therefore, politically, it may be able to exercise enough pressure to convince the Modi government that the time has come to actually change certain policies. One should never underestimate the possible impact of international pressure, especially coming from allies of the United States. The case of Manipur, I think, that I, I illustrated is an example of this. It was because of international attention, and I would say pressure, that uh, you have a, 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 a number of men <coughs> who have committed the atrocities and the alleged rape of the Kuki women. It was only after this international uh, focus appeared that uh, uh, state authorities in India actually proceeded to the arrest of those who, are, who may have been the perpetrators. So I think politically, there is a great deal that could be done, but it is, one has to admit, and I personally view it that necessary to put pressure on the Modi government, on Prime Minister Modi at many different levels. And I take this opportunity, as, as I, if I may, I noticed that you had a hearing on the status of, uh, of Tajikistan. I am going to Tajikistan as, uh, on a country mission, mission, as a matter of fact, in a few weeks. I do know the situation in Tajikistan. The situation in Tajikistan pales when we look at the massive and the degree of atrocities committed in India on the basis of religion. And so if it seems that if one country such as Tajikistan is a matter, is a country of particular concern, given what we know about India, the logic would seem to suggest that India should be considered along those lines. Well, thank you. you. You answered the second question before I asked it, so I'm going to add a little bit to it. It was, what could we do or what could be done to change what is taking place? And I think you answered that really before I asked the question. So the last question I would have is, can, it, it, and I don't know anything about the gentleman, can you appeal to his better angels? And who, who in the world has the ability to sit down and say, dear Mr. Prime Minister, this is not good, and for your uh, uh, future and for the future of India, for the good, uh, does he, d can you appeal to his better angels? And, and who could do that, do you believe? Thank you. And again, thank you. I, I've learned a lot. I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner. I, I'm an optimist. By the way, in my job, you have to be an optimist <laughs> to be involved in human rights. Um, there's a saying, I'm not sure how to translate this in English, but you always have to be honest to fr to when you're dealing with friends or allies in order to make sure that they behave in the right way. And the United States is a very close ally to India. 
it is a, a democracy, and as a democracy, I think there are much, much, uh, much that needs to be said in all frankness and honesty. In my view, it is for the government of the United States to be very frank here and indicate that there are serious areas of concern, and as a friend and an ally, these have to be addressed in order to ensure, well, peace, stability, and justice. Because if we don't have that, we are heading towards, as I said, a massive, dangerous situation in India. And this will have repercussions on the United Thank States. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have nine commissioners. Uh, our good friend David Curry uh, is in, has been in direct contact with members of the Christian community and other minorities in India. Uh, and I have the privilege of asking him to uh, ask you a few questions. Thank you, uh, Chair Cooper. Can you all hear me okay? Uh, appreciate your comments. Uh, they, they ring true to me. I've become convinced that India has the most sophisticated, systematic persecution of religious minorities by any democratic government, and I don't say that lightly. When you talk about harassment of journalists, others, you have both agents of the government and non-agent. We see this in America where they are harassing Indian citizens who live here, elsewhere. Uh, do, does the UN track that in other countries? Is that part of your mandate to track the harassment of, of the Indian government against religious minorities who are in other outside of India? trans international uh, repression, that sort of thing? Uh, yes, indeed. Thank you very much, Commissioner, for that question. Even as part as a special rapporteur, and my mandate is special rapporteur on religious, on minorities, I look at the situation of religious minorities in all countries of the world, in a sense. Although there are also other entities, UN entities, that also um, will look at uh, violations of freedom of religion, which overlaps with religious minorities around the world. And we have different mechanisms, in other words, or different committees that look into such matters. So there are many different branches, in fact, that do focus particularly on violations, not only on in India, but on every country in the world as such. I think uh, as it relates to uh, Commissioner Wolf's comments, that there's a uh, much that, our, that the United States and the UN and others can do to draw attention to this because there are very serious implications. My, my second question that I want to give uh, the floor over to my other commissioners, I, I've heard of drafts of a new constitution which uh, deny voting rights to Muslims, Sikhs, Christians. Uh, you, you mentioned, referred to a, a citizenship issue for some Muslims. H have you, is the UN tracking that at all? Is a, aware of any constitutional drafts that would deny voting rights? Um, I am not aware uh, of that being the case, if there is any. I would suspect there are, but I'm not privy to that information as such. Um, and may I take this opportunity to perhaps uh, raise w w one of your closest allies and neighbors what has occurred in Canada and the Prime Minister raising certain allegations, quite serious allegations, of Indian uh, uh, agents perhaps being involved in the assassination of a, of a Canadian citizen who is a Sikh. And as you know, the Sikhs are a member of a religious minority. Without commenting on the veracity of this, because many, many things are still uncertain, this is important in terms of making sure the message is sent clearly to the government of India that certain types of conduct are not acceptable. I repeat the three words I used earlier, massive, systematic, and dangerous. And as an ally, the U.S. should also raise all of its concerns very directly and perhaps bluntly because the situation, if I can perhaps uh, make a personal observation in conclusion, the situation in India in terms of religious freedom and the discrimination and exclusion of religious minorities is one of the worst in the world. Yeah. Thank you so much for your comments. <clears throat> just before we go on to uh, Commissioner Schneck, let me just ask, uh, what, have, what role, if any, do you see the European Union playing in this uh, situation. Obviously, you represent the United Nations. You have correctly underscored the need for the United States to pay cl closer attention. The horrific event took place in Canada. The EU is an extremely powerful economic bloc. Um, what role, if any, do you see the European uh, countries in this issue? 
I wish the European Union would listen to me, but I will be in the par European Parliament, actually, in, the, in a, few, a few days, actually. I think all international and regional organizations that are committed, if you will, to principles of democracy and human rights have a moral, and I would even say legal obligation, to, um, to exert pressure uh, on India in any way they can. Um, if we forget the moral principles on which we are built upon, then we are supping with the devil, to use a rather colorful expression. Um, this is a very, I would say, historical moment, a pivotal moment. We actually have to be honest and frank and firm in order to have the situation change. And that includes the United States and the European Union and all other international or regional organizations that were, which, uh, whose mandate actually are based on principles of either democracy or rule of law or values of, of inclusion and integration. Thank you. Commissioner Schneck. Thank you, Chair Cooper. Everyone hear me all right? Um, first, uh, Dr. Devarens, uh, let me express my gratitude uh, for you being here today and, and uh, how much I appreciate and um, am moved by the alarming uh, testimony that you've given. Um, massive, systematic, dangerous, and the three words you use to describe this situation. Uh, last November, I had uh, the duty to uh, be part of a mission of USERF uh, to Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh to witness firsthand uh, the implications of genocide, uh, the genocide occurring in uh, in Burma. Uh, one of the first groups, in fact, that we visited uh, at the refugee camps in Cox's Bazaar was a Hindu group uh, that uh, had been expelled or had 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 became refugees as a result of the situation there. So I'm wondering if we're not seeing um, the seeds of something in India that um, might point in, in a similar horrible direction. Um, if something is not done, uh, Dr. Dave Varens, um, could we be seeing um, the start of something that might truly be genocidal. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. The short answer is possibly yes. A longer answer is that there are lessons to be learned. When you deny citizenship to large groups of people because of their religion or race, that prepares the ground to treating them as lesser, lesser than you, less, lesser humans in a sense. We've seen it with the Holocaust. And in fact, when Nazi Germany removed citizenship to a number of Jews in Germany. We've seen what has happened in Myanmar and Burma when one million Rohingya, mainly Rohingya Muslims, were denied citizenship, treated as others, dangerous, lesser deserving. That created not only a humanitarian crisis, but a situation where a genocide, an attempted genocide, was easier to commit. It's not a leap of, too much of a leap of logic to say that we are creating or we, the conditions where something similar could happen. Because in Assam, they are in the process, it's not finished, but they're in the process of denying almost two million people citizenship because they are others, mainly, once again, because of their religion and race. And so we are creating conditions where this, the most atrocious of crimes could potentially happen again. Yes. Thank you. And uh, our last but not least, Commissioner, our good friend, Commissioner Magid, if you have a uh, question, last question for the Special Rapporteur. Thank you so much, sir, for your testimony this morning. I would like to ask you the, uh, about the arresting and detaining of imams in the Kashmir uh, region and the use of law, the Public Safety Act. And there's any way that this matter of detaining the imams and religious leaders in this act can be addressed in terms of um, creating a mechanism of uh, bringing uh, those uh, imams and religious leaders being 
arrested to the uh, attention of various government that are, you know, friend with the Indian government. Uh, the other issue, that the issue of censorship. I know that uh, some religious leader reading reports they, their sermon being censored, whether Christians or, or, or Muslims. I want you to shed light on this. Thank you very much for your question, Commissioner. Um, I think it is important to, to keep in mind that there have been efforts from international organizations. I have, I have uh, issued a, a couple of communications on the situation in Kashmir. And the situation in Kashmir also has be began a number of years ago, but particularly from 2019. I think what is important is to always draw attention on the need um, to guarantee the human rights of everyone, including religious minorities, imams, and others, and to emphasize India's obligations in that regard. India, and this is on, on the public record, has often claimed or asserted that because it's a democracy and, and, uh, it, and it respects rule of law, that we shouldn't worry about the situation in India. I would say that that's a facile uh, response, but what is important to, is to ensure that it is a democracy which complies with the rule of law in respect of international human rights obligations. And that last bit is missing. And this is the part I believe very strongly we have to emphasize. What is the, the law is being misused here in ways which unfortunately is possible as law because they are not fully respecting, complying with the rights of the people in, uh, in uh, Kashmir such a, and religious leaders uh, such as imams in, in Kashmir. We have tried, or I have tried, a, to some extent, to raise the visibility of this issue and to increase the pressure. I've even raised some of these issues before the UN Secretary General in New York and at the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. What needs to be done is more pressure from, in my opinion, from governments, from allies of India, to make sure that they remember that democracy with law also needs rights guarantees. And right now, you are not, you do not have the right balance in this, which allows this kind of conduct to be conducted with relative impunity. Um, once again, it is a very important for the United States, Canada, the European Union, and others to actually raise not only their concerns, but increase their pressure in a very strong, assertive, frank way. And we are doing a somewhat this at the United Nations. I believe you'll be seeing more efforts in that direction. And this is perhaps one way that you can build enough pressure to have certain gestures made. As I said, even in the case of Manipur, we were able to have individuals arrested for what occurred to the Kuki women. Um, at the governmental level, it has to be from the governmental level, government to government also that more is being done in a strong but firm way.